In the last episodes of Plant One On Me, we toured Nang Nooch Tropical Gardens grounds, visited the bromeliad and tillandsia collections, and scoped out the cycads. In this episode, we'll join Anders to see their private Hoya collection, which boasts one of the largest and most complete Hoya collections in the world. So we're gonna see some Hoyas today, so Andres is just about to pick me up. Hey there. Hi, morning. Very excited to go see some Hoyas. Excellent, let's go do that, the Hoya collection. Okay, here we are, oh, the so, uh, Hoya collection. So this is the private collection here. Completely. Oh um, my God. Not open to the public at all. There's so many. <laughs> yeah, the whole trade house here is all dedicated to Hoyas. I mean, what's so amazing is that when you go to a garden center or whatever, you see Hoya australis, Hoya compacta, Hoya carii, and you don't get a chance to see all the rest, but I mean, how many species and varieties do you have here? We have around, I think, 600 species, but over 600 a thousand species? different varieties, yes. That's crazy, because typically, like, when people talk about Hoya species, I've seen numbers like 200 to 300, but you are really, you have double that, basically, right. or triple that. Yes. Some of the species that, that we have, well, some of the names we have mm -hmm. might actually not be valid. They mm -hmm. might be synonym of, of other names at the right. moment, but... Um, we have very good record overall, uh, usually GPS recordings where they were collected. Oh. Many of them have been vouchered, uh, herbarium specimen made and deposited uh, in, in different places. Uh, we have a lot of interest of, of researchers coming, hmm. uh, looking at, uh, interesting enough, the seed pods. Oh, yeah, because it's, I never see seeds from yes. Ahoya. <laughs> it's very rarely set seed in, in cultivation. Yeah. Um, uh, but because Hoya is the sort of center of the diversity is Southeast Asia, and Thailand is part of that, of course. Um, so I believe we have the uh, natural pollinators, hmm. and they then do the job. So, so uh, do you think we'll be able to see any seed pods today, or...? Oh, yeah, there should be, there should be. How are, how are these structured? Do you have some that are hanging here, and, and you have some that are down here? Yes, um, <clears throat> we actually keep... I'm <clears throat> sorry, three, three clones of the same accession. Some of them like to grow in the small pots hanging, mm -hmm. uh, but other ones in the pot. And like this one, you know, all three looking good. Yeah. But it's good to have a backup. If you have one and it dies, you, lo you lost it completely. If you have three, you lose one, you can still pop propagate another one. Yeah. So three is a good number. And that is, I think, the number that a lot of botanic gardens refer to as like, if you want to conserve a specific species if you could have three, but not all botanic gardens could keep three because they're short on space. Yes. And um, here you have uh, a veritable amount of space in order to be able to fit these. I'm wondering, how are you acquiring them? You said researchers and you know people who maybe collect them. Um, are they coming into you at all times and you're just making room for them or? Um, the original collection came from David Little. Uh, he, Li Little, he was, um, a big Hoya collector and, and researcher in Australia. He described a lot of species. Um, and when he got older, he felt that um, his collection will not be maintained mm. at his private house. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it was so big, no one really had space to, to um, keep it all. But um, luckily he offered us the collection. Yeah. So we got the uh, cuttings of of almost everything he had. And how um, how much was that to start this like Hoya collection? Oh, that was over th three four hundred uh, accession. Wow! So he has he had collected um, uh, different clones of the mm -hmm. same species mm -hmm. from different localities, and some of them are just um, very very similar. But other one they have completely different color of flower. Um, so they're different. F they're different forms of the they same are species. Forms, yes. Okay. Can we go through a few varieties that you think? Oh, there's a. There's actually one with a flower, a flower right here. This place must smell pretty um, spectacular when at night or in the morning and they're yeah. blooming. Uh, this this one's not fully. Open. This one's not fully opened yeah. yet. But it, this has a very nice texture of the leaf. Ooh, yeah, it's a little is. sandpapery, like very it fine is. sandpaper. Hoya calistophyllite it has a nice venation also in the leaves as well. Yes. And we do have some other clones of this species where the um, pattern of the leaves are even more distinct. Yeah. 
is, are butterflies actually pollinating some Hoyas? I, I actually don't know what's pollinating it, but okay. something does it. Hoya curtisi. Actually, you can grow it like this, but in the wild, they grow up on stems and rocks and things. Well, let's see what's flowering. Here's another one that's flowering. It's, I think it's opened up. Yeah, it's opened. It's uh, Hoya burtoni, which is, um, I believe, is a Filipino species, but I think also grows in nearby countries. It has a little bit of a scent. Oh, okay. This one's such a broad leaf, paddle-shaped leaf. Hoya excavata. Much more larger and thicker. And a very distinct edge to the leaf. It's almost as if it's folding over at the edge. Yes. Do you actually propagate these by seed, or how best do you propagate them? Do you cut the, them? The, the best is, is from cuttings. Okay. But of course, if you want to make new hybrids, which is getting right. more and more popular, right. um, because you can hand pollinate some of these things, and especially in Thailand, where they, where they do set seed by themselves, uh, there are uh, quite a few Hoya hybridizer in Thailand. Hoya incrustata. This one has a nice smelling flower. Not like candy or chocolate or anything like that. Oh, and this one's interesting because they put flowers out on the same spurs over and over again. So this one you could see set flower consecutive years over years right here. Here's also a big, big leaf. Oh thing. yeah, this one's pretty meaty. The flowers are not open. Hoya glabra. The flower is not fully open yet. I think I accidentally just pulled this Fungi. Off. That's okay. <laughs> This is fun. Fungii. I accidentally just pulled this beautiful flower head off. But that's okay because they do reflower after a yeah, while. They do, they do. <laughs> Some of them are very brittle, you know, they just yeah. fall off. Oh, and this one's huge. Yes. So oh. these are mega lusters. Is, this is not the one that they call Emperor Hoya, is it? No, that's Imperialis. Okay. Does that get a larger flower? It's very similar. Very I think. similar, yeah. very similar. The one thing is when I first had Hoyas, I kind of was, I was mistreating them because I was giving them way too much light because they have such a succulent leaf. Mm. And I found that once you give them too much light, like if you're putting them, in my case, in a south facing window, they start to yellow, they start to go a little bit more chlorotic. And I've actually seen greenhouses where they have them in with their succulent collections and they're giving them probably way too much light and they start to really go like lime green and they lose that waxy sheen. And so as soon as I started to pull them a little bit further away or just put them in like a more gentle light, my Hoyas started to become um, a lot more prolific. And the other thing too is uh, that, you know, they are a little bit more succulent and they don't seem to need a tremendous amount of water all the time. No, no. Um, and that's sort of a problem when you put them in a, in a large pot as, as this one. You see the potting, is there's no soil in there. Mm -hmm. It's charcoal and a coconut chop, basically. And right. I, I think we used some broken uh, pots and things. So it's a very loose, open media, and we still have to repot them at least once a year for that. And these are epiphytic plants in the wild? Uh, most of them are, but many of them seem to start on the ground level and then hmm. climb up on the tree. Oh, right and as on. they grow up, the, the, the base attached to the ground is actually dying off. Huh. And then in the end, they're actually up in the, in the tree. Not all of them, but some of them do. And then some yeah. of the philodendrons do that as well. Yeah, exactly. They, they try to find a tree to grow up on in order to be able to get like a little bit more light. So how are you, um, what's your regime in kind of like giving them water, fertilizing them here? If you see that they're about to flower, do you fertilize them differently? We don't really water them. Hmm. Um, I think only in the dry season, we water like once a week. Wow. But in the rainy season, no water at all hmm. because rain, if not every day, every second day. So they're very easy going plants here. You mentioned the, the, the light. Um, this is 80% shade. Hmm. So you can feel it's a lot cooler. Yeah. Like other bromeliads and things, they, they're in 50% shade. Mm -hmm. So um, first we had 50%, but we got the same result as you did. Um, very yellow leaf, yeah. but they produce a lot of flowers. Because they're stressed probably. Yes. Probably, yes. Yeah. Uh, but the plants were not very strong. So now we actually opted for 
having strong plants, um, less flowers, but they still they do flower. So it's a good tip then for if somebody wants to actually get their Hoya to flower, perhaps stress it out a little bit by giving it a little bit more light yes, or I, I think you more actually, dryness. Yeah, you, if, I mean, if you have it in a small pot, you could probably move it yeah. uh, to, to more light yeah. and it probably go into to flower like that. I see an interesting one over your shoulder just because of the shape of the leaf. Mm. And this reminds me of some of the deschidias that you had mentioned that, yes. you know, have this kind of association with ants because it has this little cup-like structure to its leaves. Yeah, I heard it said in flower. Yeah, Miramacopa, which Miramacodia, I think, is like usually with, with ants, I believe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> These are falling the, the off too. The flowers just <laughs> fell off, yeah. Um, yes, I, I think like, like the Discidias, mm -hmm. um, these usually grow on, 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 the, on a stem or a larger tree or something. Mm -hmm. And having these... Cup-shaped. Cup-shaped yeah. leaves, yes. That's plenty of space for the ants to build nests and lay eggs yeah. and so on. And the ants usually tend to, I would say, like protect the plant or yeah. have other some kind of association or symbiosis with the particular plant, which yeah. is always neat to see. Yes, and there's a number of species of Hoya that does that um, with the, the symbiosis with the ants. Yeah. This but is one of them. This one is really heavily flowering right behind you. <laughs> this one also looks like the glabra, but I don't think it is. This no, one's a... Pentaflebia. Pentaflebia, yes. And this one has quite prolific. Oh, and that is a funny smelling <laughs> plant. It's uh, it's very subtle, but oh yeah. It has I don't know. It has a little bit more of an uh, like if I went walked into a a medicine cabinet a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just sli just ever so slightly. You know what I mean? That's the funny thing about some of these smells. That's just like ever so slight, and. Uh, you know, I walked in, I can't remember what species I had in my home, but I had just walked by and it was just like a slight, subtle scent. And I was just like, what is that smell? You know, and you couldn't place it. And then, because oftentimes you, even though the, the flowers are pretty big and beautiful, especially when you could see here, oftentimes you just don't even recognize that they're actually flowering. No, and many of them have more fragrance during the night. Mm, yeah, indeed. Or like early morning hours. Yeah. yeah. So you, you might wake up in the morning and it's, your apartment will smell a lot. Now this is a common one also, Hoya publicalix. This is yeah. Hawaiian royal purple, which is a type of cultivar. This one I see an awful lot in um, in homes. Not as like popular as like Australis or Carnosa or Compacta or anything like that, but I think people like this one because of the silver flecking on the leaves. Mm. And sometimes it does get like a deeper tinge on its leaves and a nice really purple flower. This is one of my favorites, but I could probably be wooed by some other plant here because there's so many. I've never seen so many Hoyas in my life. Yeah, it's hard to have a favorite when there's so many of them. Yeah. You know, they, they, some of them are very interesting growth habit. You see like this one, they seem to be arranged all on one side mm -hmm. and like, like Hoya, actually and this is would a Hoya be Australis, a, a creeper actually, or something. Yeah, yeah. And then this one's a little bit more pointy, for instance. Mm -hmm. Hoya Kenjiana, Kenajiana, K E N E J I N A N A. I I'm almost like want to spend like a full day just going over every single one of these and acquainting myself to them. This one also has got some really cool ripples in a very thin leaf and lots of little potential roots kind of growing out of here, which is like, this is an easy way to actually root. This is, you could cut them at the stem and then you could put them on some soil and they could root up very easily that way. O-N-Y-C-H-O-I-D-E-S. Uh, there's one over here. Subcalva. It usually has sort of a candy scent, but not really. Now I'm afraid to pick up some of the umbels yeah, for well, fear I... of breaking it off. <laughs> <laughs> That's an adult, yeah. Yeah, no, probably at, in the evening hours. In the evening, yes. I'm also keeping my eye out for those seed pods, but... Yeah, no, I uh, haven't seen one yet, have we? Oh, this is, is this the carii? The one with the heart-shaped yes. leaf? So carii is actually native to Thailand. Oh, is it really? Of course, some of these very distinct heart-shaped leaves, mm -hmm. this clone is not particular, but um, 
they um, in Thailand they <coughs> they took them and, and just rooted a single leaf or something. Just stuck them in a pot right, right. and hand painted them with yeah, love that. letters and things. <laughs> it's a little little cheesy for me, but um, I get it. People buy it for their for for their um, loved ones and on yes. Valentine's Day. When you root the leaf, this is an, like a question that I think uh, f you know people watching this would like to know. When you root a leaf, does it just root the leaf, or will it eventually grow into another plant, or do you have to root some of the stem as well? Yes, I think you have to include some of the stem. Mm -hmm. The leaf itself will, will, will not root, but um, it, it had, you know, like a centimeter peduncle here. Mm -hmm. So if you get that old piece there, it usually roots. It usually roots, and then you could get multiple leaves yeah. out or of that. Then the new shoots will just be a new sort of string coming out okay. like that, yeah. But if, you, if, if the, the leaves are cut too short, I, I I doubt that they will root from a, just a leaf mm -hmm. without the, but they, they will root from the petio. This one's a little unusual. Oh yes, Kanya kumariana, kumaraniana. Hmm. Oh yes, I'm not sure. Yeah, this one's really nice. I mean, still has kind of the leaves across from one another and whatnot, a little bit more of a vining habit. But this one's nice because it has a little little thick ruffled leaf. Mm, it does. This one also looks really familiar. It is. This is just a variegated uh, form of it. It's a macrophylla. Oh, macrophylla, yeah. It has a nice pattern on the leaf. Yeah, like, it does. Like, like that. But, but this is then has a um, variegated edge, mm -hmm. sort of whitish, reddish. But you were saying before, with this, um, with the, the this being the drip tip, which yep. you know I've heard that term before, but maybe you want to um, explain it. Well. Uh, usually, plants with a with a extended drip tip like this uh, lives in wetter climate, so all the water comes down and get get um, cleaned off the leaf uh, a lot faster than if you don't have a drip mm -hmm. tip. Mm -hmm. But um, like the species next to us, mm -hmm. um, obviously doesn't need that. Yeah. So it's not much of a drip tip at all. It's just a little bump there. And probably lives in a, a much hotter, less wet Dro yeah, Exactly. Dry, yeah. You can feel how tougher that yeah. leaf actually is. Yeah. So I, I sort of um, seen that there's a lot of plant groups mm -hmm. that, that have the same thing. Uh, palms and cycad as well. If, if you have a long extended drip tip, they're usually grown. I saw this one that's just kind of neat. It's got a much thinner leaf to yes. it. It's much smaller. Also very tiny little inflorescence as well. Not common, common one, one, but like, yeah. but I've seen it around, yeah. But I don't see it in the U.S. market. It might be a little bit more common in like places like Europe. Uh, here's one with the interesting round leaf, almost mm -hmm. look like a uh, like a philodendron, Hoya citrina. Is it citrina? Yeah, cr uh, or cretina? Yeah, cretina? I think the yes, yeah. citrina yeah. would be the name. Oh, that's really nice. And then, do you have a place where you're doing um, propagation of these uh, hoyas? Uh, we do. Um, all these have to be rejuvenated all the time. Yeah. Uh, once they grow older and so on. So, um, and because we have to um, tie them up all the time, so they after some time they they look ugly. Yeah. So yes, we do have an area where we we root the cuttings. Would we be able to see some of that happening? Oh, yeah, of course. oh we great! Look at that. Awesome. Uh, we got some from uh, Sweden. Mm -hmm. There's a number of very active Hoya collector there. Oh, well, that'll be fun because I'm heading over there and I'd love to meet some of those folks. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they are amazing how they're traveling around and all over. Their holidays is, is usually very specific to certain mountains and things where they go look for a particular species that hasn't been brought in. A true, true plant people. Yes. So these are fairly new, so they're not very uh, robust. robust. But here is sort of uh, oh, yeah. one that doesn't really look like a... a um, Much thinner leaf as well. Yes. Like one that I could actually bend. So this is a species from Vietnam. So I, I believe we got these um, by a Singapore Botanical Garden. Huh. So it hasn't apparently been named. It's called an SP. 
And is this, uh, is this something that vines, or is it more, it looks still looks like a viner, I guess? It does. Yeah. I'm not sure, because we just got yeah. little cuttings of it, so now we sort of tie them up, but eventually they seem to be more vining, yes. Here's another one. Is this a, this is not linearia, is it? Is. it? Okay. Yes. Yes, very narrow-leaved. Yeah. And also the one here. Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's unusual. That for Hoya. No, that wouldn't be my first guess at all. Uh, so these doesn't even have a label. It's mm -hmm. probably mean that someone collected it and, and gave it to us for mm -hmm. identification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that could be interesting to see when it's mm -hmm. flowering, what it is. You have some of them that are growing, uh, like lycopodiums, growing out from the mm. bottom. Yes, well, some of them that we, uh, that we got, they were we were recommended to actually grow them underneath the pot than on top. That is interesting. So this is a Hoya carnosa slash serpent. So it's a hybrid. And it's, yeah, you see you see here when it grows underneath the pot, it yeah. looks a lot healthier yeah. than, than the one on top. Much healthier. Yes. Griffiti, this is quite a rare one. And, and it's a bit, it looks, I'm happy it looks good because it's a bit touchy. Mm -hmm. We had it before and we lost it and mm. then, then uh, we got another one of it. Now this one doesn't look like much, but it's very interesting because it has one of those uh, shingling habits. Ah, yes, but I think this, uh, yes, this is the, um, from Philippine and Borneo, yeah. Imbricata. I've seen this in the Chattachuck market. Not mm. as dark as this, but it is one of the few that are shingling. And if you grow it on a, on a, on a, piece of dead wood or something, they really sort of hug around it, huh. like, like it is Gidea. Probably also has a, um, an ant association. Yes, yes, that has been confirmed. This is another one that I think is very common, uh, yes. the, ro the Hindu rope hoya, yes. which has this kind of compact curly leaf. Sometimes they're variegated, sometimes they have the reverse rope. Yeah. And that is... Uh, quite an easy one to kind of come by, although the reverse ropes are a little bit um, more difficult to actually find that are variegated in a reverse fashion. There was one who some, um, somebody posted, I think it was in a barber shop, and he had been had it growing it for like 30 years, and it was just huge, <laughs> which is always nice to see. When yes, yes. They get how massive they actually get, because oftentimes people get them as just little cuttings. And they don't look like too much. This one's quite nice too. So, so this is a Discidinopsis. Oh, that's interesting. So it's a completely different Proceeding. genus. Yes. But it's still in the, in the same family. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, from David Little. And that's a Parasitica. So it's probably parasitic to a tree, I would imagine, or somewhere it, it else. It could be. And is this another? Yes, it is. Discidia yes. ruscifolia. Yeah. So here's a green one and here's a variegated. Oh yeah, let's see it again with the white along the margins. Yeah. And here's another probably. These are the skidias. Yeah, these are the skidias that have the, uh, the ant forming colonies. Oh, and they're just about to flower too. Yeah, they, they, compared to the Hoyas, they, they're not that much to look at. Some of them have bright red flower though. Yeah. Well, this is phenomenal. I would love to see where you actually propagate some of these because I think that will be very yes. interesting to see. Let's go over. That's in a different shade house. Okay. We'll look at that. Okay, so this is the propagation house, not only for Hoyas, but for, for other um, plant groups that we use. We have tried a um, number of things, um, perlite, mm -hmm. vermiculite, the thing here is when you water that, everything floats up. Yeah, right. So the roots start to grow and then the whole thing floats up and they get twisted. So in the end, these are um, the coconut husk, the shell of it. And, uh, and in Thailand here, they're using these for, once you get the orchid seedlings out of the tissue culture, mm -hmm. they, just put, they just squeeze them in with this and it, they sort of help held tight with the rubber band. And then, well, the rubber band would eventually fall off. But you can see the roots go right through on the, on the bottom here. This is actually the root of the, yeah. the Hoyas. And they're ready to go. So there's no misting, because that's also a problem. Um, it's, it's too wet mm. for the Hoyas. Um, 
Are so you, we just have them on the bait. Are you rooting them at any specific time of the season? Because you had mentioned during your wet season it does get fairly wet. So are you rooting them now, like here in the hot, hotter days of winter, so to speak? Or um, are you rooting them at all, at all times? Actually at all times. Mm -hmm. The temperature here, it goes down to the, to, to the lowest is 20 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. in the winter here. So. Wow. It's, not it's not, not cold at all. <laughs> no, not cold at all. But as you mentioned, uh, this is on the plastic roof. Uh -huh. So the, the cuttings need to be protected from the rain and other mm -hmm. things. But yeah, we have plastic roof and so on. So that's... Um, I'd love to see, we'll see some more of those. Just so these varieties down here, are these also in? Yes. Coconut? And you just squeeze it in between these uh, plugs. Oh, okay. So and then once they start to grow, the, the coconut will fall apart. Right. And then the orchid can be potted up. Right, okay. Orchid seedlings grow in the same way, and you're using this in the same way as you would the orchids. Yeah. Right. Okay. Probably it's like a plug, like you, you the compressed peat plug mm -hmm. you use for tomatoes yes, or something. So like we deal with a lot more peat in the United States, right. obviously, because it's there in Canada and we're very peat centric, but it just makes sense that you do more coconut out here in coconut husk. But although I do see coconuts becoming, a, coconut coir becoming a lot more popular, starting a little bit more in the hydroponic market, but it's eventually coming over into the potting soil market as well. Coconut is usually good, but if it was sourced by sort of next to the beach, mm -hmm. Uh, especially salty. from salty, yes. Mm -hmm. And they seem to sort of, extra, the, the salt is coming out in the coconut, so we get the shell in, we have to soak it in water, and sometimes you get the salt crystal actually coming out, which is not good. That's what I heard is the biggest um, issue with co uh, coconut is the quality issues yes. as it relates it's to salination. Never, never a good standard. Yeah. You get a batch that's excellent, and you get the next one and it's not good. So after they've been rooted out, as you see there, mm -hmm. um, we put them up in, in fairly large pots like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can pick something looking fairly good. And is there a reason why you actually go from that small thing to a fairly large pot? Because I have heard that Hoyas don't mind to be a little bit more constrained. Yes, that, that's true. But um, I, I guess it's a bit of a, a laziness. Mm -hmm. So we put them up like this, and this is the size, as you saw in the collection, that we then can just hang in. So yeah, we don't so have to repot them over all and over, over again. again. So you could probably keep this in this pot for quite some time, I would say even like a decade, probably. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, with the charcoal, it's good, but yeah. well, with these um, coconut, they, fall up, they, they, they decompose very quickly. Mm. So, no, not more than a year. Okay. Oh, wait, that's, that's crazy. So you're saying that these, like, decompose so quickly because it's organic matter, and so you, you wouldn't have any kind of, like, material left for them to kind of grow? No, in. no, the half the pot would be left. Wow. And But that time, the roots were already suffering because mm -hmm. it is too, too wet. Uh, but we will use the same size of pot, yes, new potting medi media um, all the time. Well, this is great. I mean, thank you so much for showing us this because it just has really broadened my perspective of Hoyas and to see that you have so many species you know, outside of the ones that I'm familiar with is just, uh, it's really remarkable to see. And also the propagation and how you actually rejuvenate some of the ones that you have that have gotten a little bit too old. Thank you again. Thank you, pleasure to have you here. Interested in developing a deeper relationship with the people and plants around you? Then check out my book, How to Make a Plant Love You. Cultivate green space in your home and heart. More information up on my blog at homesteadbrooklyn.com. And if you're looking for more tactical plant care, then you could turn to the Houseplant Masterclass, which is the first online audiovisual course on houseplant cultivation, care, maintenance, and more at houseplantmasterclass.com.